we've got, uh, well, well, let's just move on to the event. So here we are. We'll do kind of like an hour's worth of uh, me kind of asking some questions, and then we'll kind of open up for about a half hour of some Q&A. If you guys have some questions that maybe I, I missed or you wanted to hone in on, so you get a, you know, you get a great chance to sort of interact here. Um, so with that, let's welcome our panelists. We've got, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. So we've got Selena uh, Cipriasso, a freelance journalist, a playwright, and has earned several honors in various screenwriting competitions. She's also written for ABC's All My Children, and is currently uh, co-writing two screenplays with director, producer, Diana Pargas for, uh, of Civilian Studios. Um, we've got Kenneth Lynn, whose plays have been produced, actually I didn't double check with you on this, so let me make sure. Kenneth Lynn's plays have been uh, produced all over the country. He's a graduate of Cornell, Yale School of Drama, and a Fulbright Scholar. That's correct, all right. Um, he's creator of the new limited series, uh, American Wine for USA Networks, and has jumped on board season two of House of Cards, which is coming out in two weeks. Um, and I think we're all excited for that, it's gonna be amazing. Um, and all right, and last but not least, we have Trevon Free, stand-up comedian. Uh, he's been seen on Tosh.0, uh, Chelsea Lately, The Stephanie Miller Show, the hit web series, The Gentleman's Rant, and uh, Twitter Comes Alive Comedy Tour. If you don't catch him on various comedy tour stops with Russell Peters, you'll find him writing for the WGA and Emmy-nominated The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. All right, let's give another one warm up for everybody. Thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I mean, I love, um, I love the bio. It's always like that short, sweet bit, you know. Um, but I kind of want to get back to the beginnings. Um, let's go back a little bit. I kind of want to see um, how you guys started out. Like, when was that moment that crystallized for you as writers? Um, you know, growing up, when did you kind of sit there and say, yeah, I'm going to do this as a career? I mean, it was really late for me. Um, when I was at, when I was in college, I, I didn't think that I was going to go on and become a writer. I was studying, you know, science, and I thought that I was going to go off and you know get a PhD and and uh, and be a scientist and things like that. But uh, you know, I was always interested in in you know being a dramatist, and I was in a fraternity, and one of my fraternity brothers. Um, what was making a film, and I was like, "All right, well, you know, I'm done with my classes. I'll write, I'll write your film for you." Um, and it got made, and it was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. And all of a sudden, I was a senior in college, and I was like, "I don't know what I'm going to do with my life anymore." Um, you know, everything is everything is different now. And uh, so then I did a Fulbright for a year, and then. I just wrote, and I was a really, really bad writer. Everything I wrote was really terrible, <laughs> and uh, it was—I was just like, "How does one get good?" You know. Um, and I was working at a theater. I was working at a theater in downtown New York, and it was September 11th, and you know, the theater lost like hundreds of thousands of dollars in one weekend, and and I was, you know. What theater was it? Uh, I'll, I won't name it. Since oh, it's, okay. around. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's still around though, and it's a great theater. Um, and like I remember just working there, you know, trying to learn about theater, and trying to see as much stuff as I could see, and I would like walk up to Juilliard every night, and I would just sit at the fountain there, and I would like watch the students walk up to the door, and the door went shh, and they just walked through. And I was like, how oh, does that door just open? <laughs> um, and I said, you know, if anybody ever opens that door, I'm just gonna work so hard so I can be good, because I knew I wasn't good. Um, and I applied to Yale, um, and I got all, I got in off the waiting list because somebody you decided. You were good, so you applied to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but, but a lot of it was just like having to prove it to my parents. You know? I don't know what your experience was, but like, like my parents were just like, "Why are you doing this?" My parents it was, still don't know. You know, and it was like, I was like, if I go to Yale, they can't really say much about it. Um, my mom asked me every, every like other week. What are you doing yeah, now? <laughs> yeah. And it didn't work, by the way. Even though I went to Yale, they were like, when are you going to grow up? <laughs> you know, when are you going to, you know, and, uh, and that was my big break, getting into, getting into Yale and learning from, and I had no experience. All the other playwrights in my class, they had been produced already and they had been reviewed and they were all geniuses and, 
And um, I was like, wow, well, you know, I, I had no experience. I didn't even, I didn't know what a stage manager did. I didn't know what a dramaturg did. I really didn't know what a playwright did. Um, and, but I learned and that was a great thing for me, that big break. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I, when do I want to be a writer? I, I think I've always just loved TV. It was just, I was always like, I grew up in an all white neighborhood, so I was always like the outcast, the loser. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and growing up, I didn't speak English really well. So, um, and coincidentally, I've forgotten to Gallic. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, my grandmother learning English uh, used to watch all my children, like, to learn English. She was, like, fascinated with Erica Kane. And so it's, like, one of my earliest memories was, like, watching. <laughs> This all my children episode, it made no sense. Like Erica Kane was mit in the middle of the Canadian fucking wilderness. And she's up against like a bear. <laughs> and she was like, and I'm like, oh, she's so good and get eaten. And you know, I'm like four or five years old. And she's like, I am Erica Kane. And I'm like, that's it. <laughs> and the bear's like, like you can find this clip on YouTube series. And she's like, I am Erica Kane. And the bear like runs away. <laughs> I just want to write, I want to be that lady. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I obsessively watched soaps when I was younger. And then I, I like to think that I evolved from soaps and I became obsessed with, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And, um, but it was in high school, as many outcasts do, that I started in theater. I was like, I was an actress in, in, um, on Dean and, um, and I started reading Tennessee Williams, and I just became like really obsessed with with theater and what it can do. And I I still think it's one of the most beautiful areas of writing that you can do, um, most powerful. And um, so I I start just being like a geek, and I wrote plays, really bad plays, all throughout high school. I went to NYU for dramatic writing, wrote really bad plays all throughout there. And um, yeah, and so I've just been, you know, writing ever since. Cool, cool. And did you specifically you guys both grew up in New York? No, I grew up in Maryland. Maryland? Yeah, okay. outside of Baltimore. So yeah. I'm a New Yorker. New Yorker, okay. Yeah. And Toronto, you have like a very different experience. You grew up yeah, it was, uh, I was, well, as a kid, I, I always loved writing. I was always writing. Uh, but I was also an athlete, so I was always playing sports. And I went to college, got a college scholarship to play basketball. Had a career-ending career ending knee surgery and uh, picked up just film classes and started back writing. Started doing stand-up. And after I graduated, I just kept doing it and kept writing, kept doing stand-up. And I didn't know how you submit to get on the TV show or what you like. How do you pick up that job or how do you who do you give your like mediocre script to to like <laughs> give to some executives gonna throw it in the trash? And um, I after about five years of doing stand up, I did a show with a guy who used to write for the Daily Show. And it had been my favorite show since I was like 18. So for about nine years at the time. And I had asked him what the packet was like for the show. I could just practice writing the packet. And if like by some chance there was an opening, I would try to get the packet to some person. I didn't have an agent, so I don't know who I was gonna give it to. And um, he's like, I don't have the head writer email you. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, he's full of shit. He's not going <laughs> to have the head writer of the show email me, just some guy. And um, a week later, he emailed me and yeah. said there was an opening. So uh, at the time, I had been just doing packets of shows or specking shows and doing a lot of stand-up. Uh, I did the submission for the show in summer of 2012. And uh, I got an email saying I made it to the second round. And that was just like, to me, I won. Even if I didn't get the job, I was like, oh, I'm in the second round, so no, I'm on to something. And it gets, this is where it gets really weird. Um, I didn't get the job. I came in second place to the girl who got the job. And a week later, uh, or when they told me that, that I didn't get the job, 
the showrunner emailed me right after the head writer and said that he wanted to meet with me in LA because they weren't sure they didn't want to hire me. <laughs> so it was like, we don't have a spot for you, but we really want you to work on our show. And um, so another month goes by and uh, I get a call and they say, they, we want you to come out to New York and meet with John. And in my mind, I have no idea what this is for because I didn't get the job. So I'm like, okay, I get to go to New York for free and meet with John Stewart, and I can tell people in LA that I met John Stewart. <laughs> and I go have a meeting, uh, I watch the taping of the show, and after the taping of the show, uh, he offered me a job. And that was how I got my very first TV writing job. Wow, nice, congratulations. Wow. So um, let me go into uh, your influences and writers you admire. Um, I always like to hear sort of, uh, sort of, along with sort of that, how you got into writing, but also, was there like something that inspired you? Uh, like a, besides Eric Kane, <laughs> like, like a writer specifically, or, or maybe a moment in, in uh, like, like with Eric Kane. For, for me, it was as a kid listening to Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy albums, uh, but like behind my mom's back, because I wasn't supposed to be listening to them. And uh, I must have watched Chris Rock's Bring the Pain a hundred times. <laughs> Like the nice. tape probably broke <laughs> after uh, I watched it so many times. It's just like I want people to react that way to things I said. Like it was just the most amazing thing watching people so masterful at being funny, and that was pretty much what drove me toward wanting to write comedy or even do stand up. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess for me, it's like my childhood stories. You know, and my family was just kind of chased from country to country by from by one despotic regime to the next. You know, so all of my childhood like bedtime stories were all the stories about why I shouldn't be here. <laughs> so you know, so like I was like, there's a, the, you know, so the idea that that was always a chance. You know, that like that there's like this slender little bit of time, and you're lucky to have it. Um, you know, was, was really important to me. And I think my, my grandmother didn't speak any English, but she was the one that would drag us to the movies and drag us to plays. And I became very interested in the idea that you don't need to really understand what they're saying to know what's happening. Um, and for me, as a kid who was different from everybody else, that was very powerful. Um, that like, at some level, we were all the same. Um, so that's, that's my influence, I guess. Um, influences. I mean, like, I hate to be cheesy, but like, Buffy, man. I mean, like, <laughs> Buffy was great. I so. just wanted to kick somebody's ass, and you know, um, I had just moved to high schools, and I, I had gone from like an all-white high school to um, uh, where the whites were actually the like the minor minority, and so it was like really it was, like mostly a black and Latino high school, and um, it was really interesting. I, I went to a sh I didn't know that um, home ec could have fulfilled the tech ed requirement, and so I took shop with all these guys, and these really rough guys, and I was the only chick, and they were like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't know, they put me in here. And so this one guy, he's like, <laughs> He's like, I'm from Compton. I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, Me too. <laughs> I was like, straight out of. And he was, just like, and he was like, he's like, what would, what would I, like, I had just finished watching Buffy, by the way. And he was like, what would you do if I tore your clothes off? I was like, this is a Buffy moment. <laughs> so I grabbed like this two by four and I was like, what the fuck do you think I do? I mean, like, yeah, I just, you know, it was just very empowering to watch like, you know, a female who's short, you know, and be intimidating. And um, I don't know, I just like, I just really fell in love with it. Oh, and what did you do? <laughs> oh, we became like friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you're awesome. I'm awesome. Naturally. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what would you do? Like, pour all of your clothes off. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> makes one think, you know, you've got the time. Strange point. Yeah. I'm going to start my next piece. <laughs> oh, man. So let's, uh, so we've got sort of the brief overview of the history. So tell me, what was that, uh, that first writing gig? Um, not necessarily, it doesn't even have to be TV. Um, that very first sort of paint job. Because I always like to hear, you know, because you always have the, the struggling writer, 
like who's like in their room, they're in front of the computer, they're dreaming, and they're going, man, you know, is this, you know, how do I make a living at this? So I want to know that transition, sort of that from like, hey, it sounds like you, um, Ken, you kind of went from, uh, you, you did a feature film, just sort of right off the bat, is that right? Uh, that was a smaller short student film. Okay. At, 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 when I was at Cornell. Okay. Um, for me, so I was in, in grad school and there was this theater in Atlanta called the Alliance Theater. Mm -hmm. And they had this competition where they were like, you know, every graduating student in a, in a uh, MFA playwriting program in the country send us a play. And then, you know, we're going to pick one and we're going to give that writer, you know, his or her first world premiere. So, like, well, I, I won that one, you know. Um, and it was, I, I remember getting the call and like, I was so excited, I drove up to the top of this mountain in New Haven, and then I left my keys in the car. <laughs> I was so excited. Um, you know, um, but yeah, so I, just, I won this competition, and I had my first world premiere, and you know, just agents and stuff like that came from that. So it was oh, wow. pretty wow. fast for me. But then, you know, you have like the, the high, and then you go through that low period, sure. too, which was really hard and low. And, you know, I thought that wouldn't work anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, but for me it was that, that playwright award. Okay, okay. Uh, Javon? I, um, I freelance joke writing for like, some shows in LA. Okay. I did jokes for the Trial Machine Roast. Um, <laughs> I would write jokes for other like comics and people who I knew who had their own show. And, um, but I wasn't being paid for it. It was just like, it's kind of like how you earn your stripes a little bit. Like, okay, you're funny enough to like, get jokes on TV and um, I had never had a paid TV job. I worked on some movies like acting stuff and um, I was the double for the lizard in Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man, <laughs> <laughs> um, stuff like that and uh, I never thought, like The Daily Show was the show I always wanted to work on so I didn't think, I thought I would get a lot of shitty jobs before I got the job that I always wanted and like my 30s or something, and and I ended up getting the Daily Show 27, and that was pretty much it. That was my first paid TV writing job. Wow. But you did, uh, were you doing stand-up comedy? Um... Yeah, I was doing stand-up, I was doing a web series. We were making money off the web series because uh, it had just gotten popular enough where the Google mm -hmm. ads were making us a significant amount of money. Yeah. Wow. And um, that was cool to like be making a living off of doing something that I was writing myself. So it was, in a sense, I guess, you could say I was, I had my own show that I was making money off of, but it wasn't like the money I make now by far. Sure, sure. Right. Um, that was that uh, the gentleman's gentleman's rent. Yeah. The gentleman's rent. Okay. Yeah. Great. And that was pretty much after I moved here. That was we had to stop doing the show because I couldn't like go back to LA and film often enough. And okay. Because I've seen the show and it's like. It's, uh, it's, is it a lot of comedians? Or, or it's just the same four of us. It's, it's, oh really, it's just four? Yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah, it's, it's, you guys are all writing the jokes at the same yeah, time? Yeah, we, we would uh, pick a topic, um, write a bunch of jokes. We would all four of us say we would write jokes <laughs> before we got together, but I would write a shitload of jokes uh, <laughs> to make up for the fact that like the other two guys weren't natural comedians. They were just like guys who were funny on film. And um, me and my buddy John, would write most of the jokes. And um, we would get together, pick the best 12, and we would film those. Okay. And then we would let, once we built up a big enough audience, we would let them pick topics. And we got a sponsorship from Homage T-shirts in Ohio, which is a great T-shirt company. They're not paying me to say that. It's <laughs> really good fucking shirts. <laughs> Even though they give them to me for free. Um, yeah, and then, that pretty much, we were getting offers or meetings with TV networks to try to pitch it as a TV show. And at the time that started bubbling, this happened. So it would kind of like took the steam out of that. Yeah. I, I actually, I want to even go back further than that because sure. it, sort of, it seems like, what was that point sort of even before that was sort of taking off? I mean, you were doing kind of standard uh, probably, probably when I met Russell Peters, who uh -huh. the year I started doing stand up who at the time was on the rise to becoming what he is now, which is the third richest comedian in the world, <laughs> and selling out like all over the world. And he kind of like just took to me and was like mentoring me through comedy. And then he started putting me on his shows. 
and he would pay me like ridiculous amounts of money to do like 10 minutes of stand up. <laughs> and like, it's not normal at all. Clubs don't pay shit. And uh, if you're lucky, if a, if a comic with his, even close to his amount of uh, fame or notoriety, will put you on their show and pay you and pay for you to stay at the hotel. And we kind of just became best friends. And uh, that pretty much helped me do a lot of the other stuff I was doing because he was helping. Whenever he knew I needed money, he would just put me on the show <laughs> to have a reason to not just hand me money. Ah, nice. And um, <laughs> that pretty much forced me in that direction. Cool. That sounds, sounds exciting. It's not fun, is um, Actually, it was um, plays, a play that I wrote. It was like a short 10 minute play that, um, that I wrote about my grandmother. and. Um, I sent it out to um, this contest, and it was like a small thing. Um, made a couple hundred dollars off of it to keep it in their repertory for five years. Um, but then after that, I just was writing a bunch of little plays, and um, they were getting produced. And then I just put together a portfolio, and I sent it because I interned um, at ABC Daytime. So I kept in contact um, with a friend of mine there. I sent him my packet. He lost it in his office for about a year. And I, and I went and I traveled Asia for three months and I came back and I worked in nonprofit for a little bit. And then a year later, less like, you know, maybe even six months later, he was like, I just found your packet. And I felt guilty and so I read it, I was like, it's good. And so that eventually led to me working for all my children. Cool, cool. So that was your, your first, uh, so you were interning at ABC Daytime. Yeah. And that was when it was in New York, right? Yes, okay. I interned at ABC Daytime in college and I just kept in touch with those contacts. And then after um, college, I worked in theater. And then I was just writing like short pieces. Um, and some of those short pieces just got picked up. So. Very cool, wow. So I was going to ask what your first community writing gig is, but it sounds like Siobhan, Selena, you already uh, stated it. But Ken, as far as you, what was your, so it sounds like you, you kind of got picked up uh, from this contest. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Got some attention from that. But what was your first TV writing gig? Mm -hmm. Well, I did a little like, development projects here and there, but um, my first big thing was this uh, this TV show that I, you know, sold the pitch for, um, this show American Way, okay. um, and, uh, you know, that's when I got into the Writers Guild and, and things like that, so that was my first, okay. you know, big thing. And that's, that's when you sold to the USA Networks, right? Uh, I sold it, well, to Universal Cable, which is the in-house studio for USA. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. Um, so let's go now to your specific shows that that, um, that you've written for. Um, I think we all want to know how does the uh, writers' room work for 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 your shows? Um, and that's a pretty big question, but <laughs> um, I mean, can you give us sort of like a you know, you wake up in the morning, you arrive at work. What what is kind of your day like? Uh, um, um, we start at 9.15 every morning. Uh, we, if it's Monday, we've already been working on stuff from the previous Friday to prepare for Monday, but it's always tentative in case the news changes. And um, we'll get together in the writer's lounge. It's a giant TV screen, a uh, computer that's hooked up to it, and we have this program called Snapstream. It's like a DVR that records like 70 shows, new shows every day, like all these different networks we take uh, clips from. And over the course of the evening and days previous, all the writers are sending out pitch ideas, so email ideas for stories, ideas for uh, different headlines and different chats we can do. And at the end of the day, the head writer shows those to John. He decides which handful of those he likes the best. We'll get together, we'll watch material for those stories. And as we're watching it, we're riffing on it and coming up with ideas, deciding what our take is going to be. And uh, if something comes up, if John decides he likes it, uh, he gets assigned to two writers. And if it's like a real like hard, tough thing like anything with financial crisis and things like that, the two writers will write it together. Mm -hmm. But normally you write two separate passes of the story or of the headline. And then you read over it with John at about uh, 11, 
45. He'll go over with you which jokes he likes from both passes. Uh, take those. And he'll also decide if maybe you've given him an idea for another take or a different direction. He just wants to see as much as he can to figure out if there's something he's not seeing or something else he, he like thinks of later. And he'll send you off with this take or direction. 